Swadikap. Good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone, especially friends from many other countries. First of all, congratulations to Manfred and his team, some of whom are not here, so I want you to applaud absent friends for child rights. <laughs> Especially the children and the young people the world over. Very sad on many fronts, but we are here to bring hope. So, exercise. Hands up if you are from the police. All right, ties. Uh, we need to do a bit more when we go home. We need to bridge build with the police, good police, to help us a bit more. Hands up who's here from the Ministry of Health that deals with persons with mental disabilities. We need to do a bit more work, especially the ties, who will carry on after this to share the responsibility with our dear friends Manfred and others. Who's here from the Ministry of Justice? Hands up. They're the ones who should be focal point next, as advocated by our eminent friend here. Hands up who's here from the military that I have to work with sometimes to bridge build. Hands up. Hands up who's here from the Ministry of Interior. Hands up. So UNICEF and us locally and others, we have to work a bit more, please, to bridge build, to carry over the wonderful work undertaken by our friend Manfred, to be fair and to respond well to the children who are not here. Because when the children are not here so much, the others who can't are also not here so much. And they all need to be here either here or there or somewhere together with us in terms of follow-up. So that is the exercise in terms of physical commitment to follow-up that we need to take over as our humble responsibility next. Having said that, let me now enable you to relax with three observations, sort of, six suggestions, and then maybe six orientations, but preceded by two anecdotes. I visit children's prisons and brothels once in a while. And once upon a time, I went to a closed institution. And when the supervisors were not there, we got talking with the young people who shouldn't have been there at all. And ultimately, we talked about violence in the institution. So I said, well, when, when does the violence take place? What's the violence? So this young boy said, well, actually, it takes place before bedtime, when the supervisor's not around. The bullied sort of gang phenomenon within that borstel. So the lesson learned from there was and is that we are dealing with a culture or subculture of violence through institutionalization, which has long-term impact, sadly. So please, let's not forget that, especially those who deal with institutions. Beware of a culture or subculture of violence, which is inherently there by the very fact that people are locked up with a certain power relationship, abused, misused here and there. That was in a developing country. And then, this very uh, concrete air-conditioned facility in a developed country. And there I was with this young man in this room. There was no window. It was all artificial lighting. And this boy was let out into the gardens once in a while. So I sat there talking with him. And I said, well, I mean, what, what might you wish for, so to speak, you know? even in this environment. So he pulled out these little sketches and paintings from under the bed in this room, air conditioned, where there was no window, and there was no con window around at all. And all the pictures were about colors, environment, sun, sea, 
It made me or makes you wonder about how we enable people to heal a bit. In other words, if you really wish to enable to people to rehabilitate and heal, we need to nurture a responsive, transformative environment that's dignified, that enables people to regain their self-esteem, have a purpose in life, to care and to be cared for. So that was also my lesson from visiting an air-conditioned facility in a developed country, which at that time imposed the death penalty on those under 18 years of age. Two anecdotes. When we come then to three observations, uh, particularly concerning dear Manfred's study, um, the team has done a fantastic job, scientific, uh, empirical, participatory. And I want to highlight the fact, first of all, that the finding that there are roughly 1.5 million kids deprived of liberty per year, de jure, has to be multiplied several times, five times maybe, sadly, in reality, in terms of what's known as de factor. And if you read the full report, which I've read on the internet, you will find the methodology, which you don't find so much in the 20, 30 page report. And the methodology there is called regression analysis. And I would like UNICEF and others to enable us to build on this to help us generate data at the local level through accessible methodology in terms of statistical computation and estimation. And I think that's very valuable offshoot methodologically from the study. Secondly, to be fair to the study, as has been said, the study is about state-related institutions and deprivation imposed on the child or linked with the child. It does not cover family situations. It doesn't pretend to cover situations where the girl child is locked up by a family in a conservative setting and not allowed out or punished at home or whatever. And that's been implied to some extent. But it's not an area we're neglecting, but we must be fair to the mandate which has focused incredibly well on state-related institutionalization, so to speak, or the interlinks with that. It's a beginning, but it's not an end. And thirdly, what's the follow-up at the national level? What's the follow-up at the national level, which is the crunch? And it's the crunch that I would like to broach, testing a little bit, as a sort of friendly guinea pig or whatever, or guinea animal, testing our friends' responses in Thailand. So let's have a look at six suggestions for friends in Thailand as to what we should do practically, pursuant to the excellent study, which calls upon us to share the responsibility, which we should share, to be fair. The study looks at six areas, six areas of concern. So let me succinctly try to pick out about two doables per area, testing Thailand, which may resonate with ASEAN and others. So let's have a look. Number one, administration of justice. Children in brothels, in so-called observation centers, prisons and so on. Thailand has been quite open to the possibility of diversion and deinstitutionalization. Why? The legal framework is there to some extent, and I'm not sure whether it's there in some other countries, but test it. We have a juvenile justice law which promotes deinstitutionalization. We have juvenile courts in every province with an observation center, which is basically an, a bostel so to speak, but less of an incarceration modality now, more as a sort of management to get children out into the community rather than 
detention, so to speak, in the form of Brussels. But what are some of the two main challenges there for Thailand, which we need to do now with all the partners, some of whom are not here? Number one, it is a shame that the age of criminal responsibility is so low. It used to be seven. And many of us tried to push it up to 12, including my humble self, as the then chair of the Subcommittee on Child Rights in Thailand. And we were reversed by Parliament. We were reversed by Parliament, which pushed it down to 10 years. So how many parliamentarians are here, please? Hands up. <laughs> Whether you're military or not, because the military sit in the Senate still. But at least we're inviting you, parliamentarians, to be a bit more child friendly. Please reform it to push it up to 12. And please to 14. All right? Because we worked on 12, which was the previous CRC recommendation. Now 14. Get it up to 16 or 18. Do other thresholds, even higher, please. But push it up. It's been stuck there for 10 years because of low policy, political commitment, political will. And number two, while we advocate more rehabilitation and deinstitutionalization de in terms of um, administrative, administrative justice, we have a problem with the drugs law. The drugs law opens the door to rehab, but if you are indicted for having more than a number of grams or milligrams of drugs on you, then you, you, don't, you don't fit into the possibility of rehab. You're just conveyed to the prison system and beyond. So threshold concerning drugs, realistically dealing with it, so we enable people, including young people, to go into rehab rather than being caught in the web of criminalization through the rather draconian thresholds that still interplay with everyone including kids who might be indicted for drugs. So those are two propositions for Thailand we, we need to look on. Age of criminal responsibility and diversion, decriminalization, deinstitutionalization, particularly as regards drugs-related offenses. Secondly, under Mand Manfred's study, children in prison with primary caregivers, primarily children with women who are detained, my two pieces of advocacy here are, number one, emphasize even more strongly the best interest of the child by consulting the child if possible, but having checks and balances there. And number two, when we ultimately have to separate mother and child, then we must have provisioning, well prepared, early provisioning, and a very child responsive mentally um, responsive approach together with uh, the possibility of, of, of teaming up together mother and child uh, as best they can even when they've been separated. And on this front, what will be resonant for Thailand is that we have the Bangkok rules. We have the Bangkok rules on women, the UN rules called Bangkok rules, dealing with women in prison and non-custodial care. And many of the rules concern children. So Thais, Bangkokians, please just apply the Bangkok rules. Some of the rules, Bangkok rules adopted by United Nations 2010, linked with Vienna on women in prisons and non-custodial care, together with children, include rule 52. If there's a decision to separate mother and child, it must be based on individualized assessment and the best interest of the child. This is to complement and strengthen what Manfred said. And if the child is to be removed from the mother, from prison, it must be done with sensitivity and only when alternative care arrangements for the child are available. So there are various conditions there. 
And once separated, there must be maximum possibility for the mother and child to meet based on the best interest of the child. But you know, Thai law also is quite odd on mothers who are incarcerated. The death penalty can be imposed on women who have a child, pregnant and have a child. It can be suspended for three years after the birth of the child. It can be suspended. But if the child dies during that period, the mother can still be, in law, punished by the death penalty. Very odd law. I don't know who drafted that. So the suspension is very much contingent upon the child's survival after three years. Uh, I would have thought the better way to be would be to do away with the death penalty altogether, uh, not only for pregnant, pregnant women, but also for women who give birth uh, as a whole. So those are some examples from the Bangkok rules as well as some of the anomalies that still interplay with us. Thirdly, migration related. Thailand last year adopted the MOU to bring children out of the immigration, call it detention or whatever system, which is good, which is good. And now Thailand is to implement a screening procedure for what internationally we call refugees to offer protection in terms of temporary asylum, which brings to mind two pieces of advocacy relevant here. Number one, please make sure that we get the whole family out of immigration detention. At the moment, the emphasis is on mother and child under 18 years, but we want families to remain together so don't forget the father, please. Please try to enable them to stay together. Shift the lodging to shelters run by the Social Development Ministry. Anyone from Social Development Ministry? Hands up. And make sure they're together. And personally, I do not think immigration-related contraventions should be seen as crimes. They are just administrative infractions. They're not crimes. I mean, these good people who come in without visa, without permission, should not be treated as criminals, especially if they've been escaping from warfare and persecution. So let us implement the MOU in a humane, comprehensive manner to cover the whole family and help immigration officials by shifting that burden towards the shelter run by the social development people well. And secondly, in view of the forthcoming screening procedure for so-called refugees in Thailand to be implemented in a few days' time, please don't forget that the child under 18 might also be applying for protection under the screening. So please listen to the child, work on the best interests of the child, and abide by the guidance of the UN, UNHCR, on unaccompanied minors and beyond in terms of basic protection. Fourthly, the question of institutions, children in institutions, so-called homes, so-called maybe even hospitals sometimes, uh, which are walled. The thrust in Thailand is to move towards deinstitutionalization and diversion. But there are anomalies which deserve good advocacy. Number one, big issue on those with mental disabilities, including children. This does not fall immediately under the general Persons with Disabilities Empowerment Act which tries to follow the Convention on Persons with Disabilities. But the issue of mental disabilities falls under the Mental Health Act, which is a different configuration. And under that, there are various measures which are still on the books, such as maybe straight jackets, maybe electric shocks, and so on, some of which are referred to in Manfred's study. So please, please work well on the issue of persons with mental disabilities. And let's work well with the Ministry of Health to find other ways 
And this affects ASEAN as a whole. ASEAN, please do a study on persons with disabilities, particularly mental with disabilities. This is not just a wheelchair issue, it's a straitjacket issue too, which has to be dealt with well. And secondly, let's move towards good community support for alternative care, as well as monitoring of state institutions, which are not necessarily prisons, but they could be homes here and there, so-called homes under various laws where people are institutionalized. This is already advocated by the CRC Convention. Fifth, the issue of armed conflicts. As has been said already, we're not talking about incarceration by terrorist groups, but when kids are transferred to state facilities, so to speak. And of course, of course you're back to square one as to how to deal in war situations with people who are incarcerated as a whole. And civilians, including kids, should not be incarcerated. And there we have guidance in terms of demobilization needed also of those who might be involved in the conflict. And treat the child as a victim is key. Whether in peace or in war, but particularly in war there when they are incarcerated, together with a very difficult issue of what do we do with the children of terrorists in terms of repatriation to the countries of origin, which is not settled at the moment as an issue. And last but not least, national security. Well, if we advocate national security, I tend to advocate that national security has to be seen as an exception to human rights rather as a rule over human rights. In other words, if states invoke national security, they must provide justifications. And in real terms, there are two pieces of advocacy which are needed here, which were aired before the Child Rights Committee already. Number one, on national security and children incarcerated. Precisely because in southern Thailand, and at, at times the whole of Thailand, is under emergency law, such as the Marshall Law, Emergency Decree, Internal Security Act, and various military orders, which are still on the books. We must advocate, as we have been advocating for a long time, that if a person under 18 years of age is detained anywhere, or to be detained, the person must be taken to the juvenile courts to use the juvenile justice system civilian juvenile justice system, for which there would be no exception, no resort to military courts, as happened not so long ago, no resort to emergency laws, please. Just use ordinary law. We're not against discipline, but use ordinary law, which is based on international standards, particularly the Juvenile Justice and Juvenile Courts Act that we have which has now been bolstered by a rehab law two years ago, which opens the door to community programming, as well as family supports, as well as a managerial position for the courts and the previous bostels to decentralize and deinstitutionalize. And last but not least, on national security. For those under 18, the starting point must be that we have to look at them as victims. Give kids a second chance even when they are apprehended for national security reasons. And in this country, like many other countries, there are too many impositions in terms of national security laws to date. So those are six areas in terms of suggestions. And very finally, succinctly, hopefully, last but not least, well, what do we do with the ties to follow up from Manfred's wisdom? Well, number one, in terms of national focal point, which is advocated in the big report. It has to be interagency. But who, who is obviously to be part of interagency? Well, it's all the ministries that I've just voiced who are not here at all, except one, one good policeman, welcome. We need all the other agencies here, Ministry of Health, MOI, what about the military, the judge advocates chambers, the ones that I have to advocate all the time, don't lock kids up under emergency law, please, shift to the juvenile justice system. Effective, comprehensive interagency response, very important. And in terms of complaint system, the Human Rights Commission accepts complaints from children too. So bring them on board too. And Thailand's a party to the 
Protocol 3 of the Child Rights Convention, which opens the door to communications of the Child Rights Committee. Number two, national policy is not that difficult. All these Southeast Asian countries, they have national policies. We're not lacking in words. We have a national policy. We have a human rights agenda in Thailand that covers children. It's not difficult to integrate in theory, but what is difficult to integrate is in implementation. And look, they find SDGs very sexy. So every country now fashionably integrates SDGs into their national policy. But ESCAP, UN evaluation two years ago, pointed out that with regard to SDG 16, which covers violence against children and human rights and rule of law, there has been regression in the Southeast Asian system. Instead of lowering, reducing people locked up, unsentenced prisoners, there has been a climb in unsentenced prisoners in Southeast Asia. There has been regression on SDG 16, which is a testament also to how that might affect children as an indicator. And sadly, Thailand has the biggest number of detainees in Southeast Asia, between 400,000 to 500,000. And that's general, huh? including adults. Thirdly, so many laws, too many laws, implement them well. But the trend is not bad. It's toward deinstitutionalization de and diversion. And um, as I said, we now have, re have a rehab law. But really, we need to deal with laws that are not on children. What about the drugs law? which has been reformed to some extent. But what about the issue that I just raised earlier in terms of the threshold of how or not to incarcerate people generally? You have to deal with drugs-related laws in terms of child-friendly response too. Fourthly, resources, money and more. Money and more, yeah. But of course, social resources here. I mean, all the pro bono work that Manfred generated, very important. But data are also a resource, so please share with us, cross-learning, how to have good methodology in terms of collection data. Otherwise, they'll always say we don't have data. We want to learn about regression analysis, to be, have progression analysis, please, in Southeast Asia. Five, community family supports, sure, we have a law on that, but let's implement that well. Aim for non-custodial provisions, please. Non-custodial. Waste of money to build another prison. Invest in people, invest in families, ultimately. And last but not least, don't forget the voices of the children and youth. In Thailand, we have a child and youth development law, which promotes youth councils throughout the whole country. This law was adjusted in the past year. Now we're going to have youth councils committees at the sub-district level, at the district level. So enable them to link up with all these facilities. And they are linked up with various homes run by the Ministry of Social Development in the, in the provinces. I had the pleasure of um, interlinking with them on the internet just a month ago. Enable them to be involved, peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer visiting, get young people to visit those who are in institutions, in brothels or whatever, get them involved and get them to advise the provincial governor and ultimately the parliamentarians who also count in today's world. So, leave no one behind, leave no child behind bars, but don't forget, tackle the subculture of violence which comes with deprivation. And please be part of the greening of justice to have a transformative environment. Thank you.